my name is Taryn Hart and I'm with Occupied Media and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. And my name is Coy Robin and I blog at CoyRobin.com. Great. And you've also recently written a book. Maybe you should <laughs> introduce that. That's true. I forgot. <laughs> uh, the books, um, I just wrote a book called The Reactionary Mind, uh, Conservatism from Edmund Burke to Sarah Palin. Very good. Um, so I, I've watched a few different interviews of yours. I'm going to link one that you did with Chris Hayes that I thought was really interesting um, that also had a Q&A with it. Um, and I wasn't I wasn't sure where to start. I mean, I think the kind of ways people have started um, is either by having you kind of define what your what your idea of conservatism is, because it's really, I think, quite different than what the common conception of conservatism is or to start with kind of the misconceptions of conservatism. Um, one of the things I wanted to try to see if we could do is to see how you would how you would um, put Occupy Wall Street in the in the in terms of um, I guess the type of opposition that I think conservatism as you've defined it has arisen um, in reaction to so is that that's probably too vague to start <laughs> uh, well do you want to start with about where does Occupy Wall Street fit? yeah let's start there Okay. I, I kind of think we can almost have any point of entry and we'll get to sure. the various points. So, yeah, that's a good place to start. Okay. Well, I mean, I think um, it's pretty uncontroversial that for about the last 40 years or so, there has been a major uh, right-wing offensive in this country, um, which has been uh, situated on multiple different fronts, but, but, but a, a centerpiece of that has been the effort to beat back the redistributive state of the 20th century uh, and to make society uh, less equal than, in fact, it was in the 1950s and the 1960s. And that effort uh, has been, I think, a huge success. The United States right. is now you know, the most unequal that it has been in, in quite a while, and it's certainly amongst the most unequal societies in the world. Um, that fits within a, a, a standard or a part of the definition of conservatism that, that I'm talking about. But one of the things that I talk about in my book is that part of the way that conservatism has been able to essentially sell inequality, sell privilege, is by making it seem popular. Um, in other words, it has, it, it has promised uh, more than a small group of people that you too can be uh, an aristocrat. Um, you too can be a little lord, um, and that's been true of conservatism from the very beginning, from from the 1790s, in reaction to the French Revolution. Um, and one dimension of that, in, in in I would say the last couple of decades, has been the idea that Wall Street is a popular institution, a populist institution. For most of this country's history, Wall Street has really been something reviled by uh, most people. It has been not something that people have really liked. But beginning in the 70s and the 80s, there was a real offensive to make Wall Street um, your friend. Uh, you know, every man a speculator, which is the name of a, of a book, of a very good book about Wall Street. You know, we're all, we're all in it. We all have pension funds and so forth. Wall Street is us. I think what Occupy Wall Street, I think that the genius of it is it is the first real effort to say, no, in fact, Wall Street is not us. Wall Street is, in fact, the, par the party of the oligarchs, it, the party of the aristocrats. And I think that's why uh, the defenders of Wall Street, um, both the, the, the bankers, the financiers themselves, and their political spokespeople in the media and the Republican Party are so threatened by it um, because uh, they recognize you know, that the pitchforks are really coming um, or might be coming. We don't know yet. We don't know where this movement is going. Um, and so I, I, I see this as, as a real um, kind of confrontation that's been very long in the making, uh, and it's it, this could just very well be the opening shot across the bow. We just have no idea, but it's um, it has deep roots. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so, in 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 general, you know. You've taken on some ideas, I think, 
you know, a lot of people on the left had about conservatism, you know, one of which is that, you know, modern conservatism is something new, that, that it's changed, that, that in fact, you'll hear a claim that, um, in fact, they're not conservatives at all anymore, that, that, um, uh, you know, because they're, you know, in, and you'll hear it even with respect to Occupy Wall Street, that, you know, we're trying to restore the rule of law, these types of things, which are considered kind of conservative notions. So can you maybe discuss how your work relates to that idea? Sure. Yeah, I mean, let's start with the misconceptions that I try to go after in the book. The first, it starts really with the term conservatism itself. This has led, I think, a lot of people to believe that what conservatism is about is conserving things, uh, preserving things, valuing tradition. Uh, and I think this is just dead wrong. Um, conservatism does try to preserve some things, namely the um, institutions of hierarchy and privilege, right? But right. it certainly doesn't seek to preserve things as a whole. Um, so I think that that's wrong, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Or that conservatism, because it's about preserving things, is a quiet disposition. It's something that, as you said, is about the rule of law. It, um, it, it, it is wary of grand political adventures. It's wary of ideology, right? All of these sorts of notions. And again, I try to show that that's wrong. Now, the reason why all of this, or one of the reasons I should say why this matters is, as you pointed out, in recent years, I would say really, um, you know, from the Bush years onward, you began to hear a certain claim on both the left and the right that somehow or another the Bushies, the neoconservatives, the people who brought us the war in Iraq, uh, were not conservative precisely because they were so radical, because they loathed the rule of law, because they weren't interested in preserving anything, they were interested in destroying things, and that somehow or another this was new, this represented a break. Now, I just should parenthetically say that you also heard the very same claim in the 1980s about Reagan uh, from people on the left and the right. You heard the very same claim in the 1960s about people like Barry Goldwater. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very old claim. And you always hear the same story. At some point, you know, conservative, conservatism went off the rails. And if you actually look at the history of conservative thought, and I really go back to the very beginning in the book, to Edmund Burke and the reaction to the French Revolution, you find out that conservatism has never been the way we understand it. Uh, it has always been a radical, counter-revolutionary, revanchist uh, movement. And there's a reason for that. I'm sorry, this is a very long way. You'll have to <laughs> no, it's good. This is good. <laughs> um, there's a reason for that, which is that conservatism as an ideology from its very beginning has always arisen in reaction to a very particular type of political movement, and that is a movement of emancip emancipation from below, a movement that wanted to liberate men and women from the fetters of their superiors. So in other words, not just a movement of equality in the abstract, right, that everybody should have the same amount of money or something like that really that movements that were about breaking really uh, personal bonds that tied together a superior and a subordinate, uh, the feudal lord and the serf, the, the master class and the slave, a husband and his wife, uh, a factory owner and his workers. Now, I mean, we should be clear here, these are very different kinds of relationships. They're not all the same. Uh, they're not equivalent. But what they have in common is this relationship of personal domination in all of them. And, and, and the movements from the left have always arisen to try to break those bonds. Conservatism always is a response to those movements. And therefore, uh, it has had to figure out a way to combat those movements. And what it has figured out is, if we're going to, if, me, if we, the conservative, I'm speaking for them now, are going to combat the French Revolution, if we're going to combat the abolitionist movement, if we're going to combat the labor movement, we need to be in some ways as radical as they are. We need to learn from them. And you see this in the writings of Burke, you see this, you know, like I said in the book, you, you, I trace it through all, you know, up through Barry Goldwater, Margaret Thatcher, 
Uh, Margaret Thatcher said very famously, the other side have got an ideology, we need to have one too. In other words, we need to um, outleft the left, as it were, right? We need to borrow from them. And so in the course of that borrowing, that imitation, that mimicking, which is sometimes, I should say, just again, parenthetically, is very self-conscious and strategic. Other times it almost happens behind the back of a conservative without them realizing it. But in the course of that process, you see the conservatism becoming a much more dynamic, much more movement-based, much more mass-based uh, movement of the street that is ideological uh, and expansionist. And again, this isn't something that the neoconservatives invented in you know post-2002. This was true of conservatism from the very beginning. And so, and I think your answer to how are they able to do this, given that it really only benefits a few, is that is that you reject the notion that there is you know, that it really is only benefiting a few, that there are these gradations of hierarchy, right? So that it's not that people are that are misapprehending their interest in a kind of what's the matter with Kansas type thesis, but that really, you know, conservatives have taken great pains to create, you know, this kind of bloated management class so that there's ridiculous amounts of hierarchy that people have to defend in the workplace or um, these types of things. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I, what I say is, is that conservatism really takes its cues in this regard from feudalism. Um, what was feudalism but a very elaborate hierarchy or ladder of gradations with ever, uh, you know, particularly toward the end of feudalism, you see this where they created ever more infinitesimally small gradations of rank, particularly at the higher levels. Um, and what conservatism does is a version of the same thing, only it multiplies those gradations of rank at the lower levels. So, for instance, in a, you know, if you go to any workplace today, right, you've got your, you know, your uh, online supervisor, you've got the supervisor supervisor, you've got the supervisor, I'm the deputy assistant to the supervisor and all of the rest. And, and, and what conservatism does is to basically promise its subordinates that, you get a piece of the you get a piece of the pie. You know, you get to partake of this inequality um, because you get to dominate somebody beneath you. And I think this is where the left really does get it wrong because, um, as you you know, you brought up the "What's the matter with Kansas?" Uh, trope, which you know basically said you know the the argument of the left is the way conservatism sells its inequality to the masses is by tricking them by saying oh, you know, abortion is really the issue, or those fancy Ivy League professors, they're your problem. And I just think that's, that's not true. I think the way conservatism sells its promise uh, to the masses is to say, you too are a little lord, just like me. It just happens that your lordship is in a smaller uh, fiefdom. You know, if you're a husband, it's your family. If you're a plant manager, it's your plant, you know, it's the factory, whatever. Or under slavery, it's, you know, you're a slave catcher, something like that. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's, where it, that's where the action is at for you. And that's not um, tricking anybody. That's, that's real. Those are real forms of power. It oftentimes involves a little bit more money than your subordinates make. It certainly involves more supervisory power. And so I, I think that's the way conservatism really, that's the promise that it sells, uh, to, to, to ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Well, so one thing, I mean, I think one of the reasons that the kind of, there's a modern conservatism that's really turned its back on, you know, there's, I think it's referred to as the movement conservatism in some instances. Some of the reason that I think that is compelling um, is that there does seem to be a difference in terms of, I guess, an, an embrace of anti-intellectualism among people like Sarah Palin that you didn't see with, say, William F. Buckley. Right. Not really true, because remember, I mean, you're right, Buckley on the one hand affected a kind of intellectualism, but how did right. Buckley become William F. Buckley? He wrote a book called God and Man at Yale, and it was a scathing attack on the universities. Now, it wasn't an attack, it wasn't necessarily an attack on professors as such, although it got kind of close to there, but it really was an attack on uh, a certain pointy, you know, pointy-headed intellectuals, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see this often, you know, you see this, frankly, going back to Burke. I mean, 
uh, you know, the whole attack on the French Revolution is that, you know, not just Burke, but amongst a lot of conservatives, is that it's a revolution of the philosophes. It's a revolution of the intellectuals. And that what we, the conservative, represent is a different uh, kind of sensibility, one that's not rooted in book learning uh, or that kind of intellectualist smarts. Uh, in the 20th century, Michael Oakeshott, uh, who was a very influential, very intelligent. I mean, all, the irony is all these guys are, you know, intellectuals themselves and quite sophisticated. Right. But, you know, Oakeshott uh, famously he wrote an essay called Rationalism in Politics, where he said that, you know, he, he sort of, um, what's the word, uh, kind of made fun of the left because, you know, he basically said this is a politics of the, it, uh, it's not a, pol it's a politics of the cookbook. It's people who don't know how to really cook because they didn't learn it from their mothers or from a long tradition, right? It's people who learned how to cook from a book. Um, it's recipe followers. And that's, I think, um, that notion that the left is kind of rooted in book learning as opposed to native knack and know-how uh, has been part right. of the conservative tradition from or the beginning. Or tradition. Or tradition. Exactly. Right. 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 So, okay, another idea that you take on... Um, is this idea that conservatism is the defender of freedom and the left's kind of buying into that construct uh, that yes, you are for freedom, but we're for equality and equality is more important than freedom. And that's, I mean, uh, I mean, that's really, you know, I mean, John Rawls starts a theory of justice by saying, you know, I'm going to reconcile liberty and equality, right? This, right. and, 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 you know, it spawned a lot of people have taken it on, but I don't think they've taken on that idea right. um, that there's this inherent contradiction between liberty, liberty and equality, but you do. And yeah. so go on. <laughs> well, <you> know, <laughs> in some ways I, I, I take my cues from Jerry Cohen, who was a Marxist philosopher who wrote a lot of very um, sophisticated criticism of Rawls. And mm -hmm. um, what, what Cohen said was, is, you know, he, he really said that the left makes this mistake, and I won't get it. He, he gets into this with, um, he uses a very complicated analogy of somebody having not being able to buy a train ticket to go farther. You know, somebody wants to be able to go to point A, but doesn't have enough money to go to point B. And he says, well, is that an issue of equality or is that an issue of freedom? And he, he basically makes the case that economic means are not just a lack of means. They actually are really concrete abridgments of liberty. Um, and I, you know, that's where he, he built that up from a, in a philosophical way. But I also come to this as somebody who worked as a union organizer. And, um, you know, in my experience, um, uh, with, in various, you know, very different kinds of workplaces, I should say, uh, you know, for a person who works for another person, that distinction between freedom and equality is very artificial and very abstract because what does it mean to actually work for another person? Um, you know, let's say you work in a hotel and you're a, a maid, right? It means you have, you're being told what to do all the time. You're being told not to talk back. In fact, I just read a story about Pomona College in LA. Uh, there's a union drive going on there among cafeteria workers, I believe, or campus workers. And the administration has issued a policy saying no students are allowed to talk to the workers in the cafeteria on their break. You're literally, the workers are not allowed to speak to the students. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a kind of an abridgment of freedom of speech that is not, you know, is, is quite real. And, and, and it happens to, it's, it's, it's very common in, in the workplace. And I could multiply the examples. So I think, you know, that relationship, what part of it is an abridgment of freedom? What part of it is an abridgment of equality? It's very hard to divide that, you know, for, you, analytically, I think. And so I, I, my point is to say that those relationships of domination, right, where you, can, you really literally control what another person does. I mean, think about a drug test in the workplace, right? You literally have, you know, have control over a person's bodily fluids. You know, they have to urinate in the cup, oftentimes with the supervisor standing right outside the stall door to make sure that it's not, you're not faking that it's somebody else's urine, right? That kind of relationship uh, 
is a serious abridgment of freedom, um, not to mention privacy and, and, and a lot of other things. Um, and it's constitutive. It's not exceptional. It's, it's part and parcel of what it means to be in a modern capitalist economy. Uh, and the left, going back to the beginning, has really been about challenging those relationships of domination, those very personal relationships of control. And as I argue, particularly in the family, in the case of the women's movement, and the workplace in the case of the labor movement. I think those are the two fundamental spheres, uh, particularly in the 20th century, that the left has fought over and that the right has resisted uh, progress and emancipation over. Uh, and that's why I think the claim that the right stands for freedom is, uh, is really misbegotten. What it stands for, insofar as it does stand for freedom, is the freedom of the superior to dominate the subordinate. Mm -hmm. Right. I, that's, and I think that's an incredibly compelling argument with respect to the workplace. And it reminded me of something that's kind of been rolling through my mind. And I haven't thought through this completely. But there's a claim, there's, you'll see signs with Occupy Wall Street that'll say debt equals slavery. Right. Um, right. So that there's this, and and I think that, and it's kind of the same theme in terms of does how does economic inequality impact your personal freedom? Does it impact it more than, you know, other things? And I mean, I think, you know, being in debt, being indebted has a huge impact on what people can do and what their, you know, freedom of movement, freedom of action is. And David Graeber actually, um, in his history of debt, uh, said you know, goes back and set and and looks at um, the first kind of credit economies being in Samaria, and that people would, uh, you know, there would be um, a crop failure or whatever, and you'd have a debt crisis, and people would leave the society um, because they were so indebted, and occasionally people would have to come in and wipe the slates clean, and he makes the point that the first word for freedom that there ever is literally means return to mother and he kind of suggests that it might have to do with this wiping clean of the slate so that's a very interesting idea i don't know if you think it also applies in in debt to that way or if occupy Wall, those kind of claims that debt equals slavery and this type right. of thing is right. valid right. but yeah i mean the the um the 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 parallel i would really think of is indentured servitude um, right, which right. was, of course, the way a lot of early Americans came over to this country was as indentured servants. Um, but also, probably even more viscerally, after the Civil War, the way that a lot of African Americans were essentially, if not legally, but essentially re-enslaved, was through debt, debt peonage, which, of course, throughout the Third World, you know, Latin America, places like that, has always been a major form of the maintenance of servitude is 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 debt. So. I do think there's something uh, to that argument, and uh, it's interesting. You know, it, I, I've noticed that as well. How it's become such a central part of the um, discussion in Occupy Wall Street. You know, it's it, the, the unfortunate thing is that it tends to get treated as a kind of a studenty problem. This is something you know in your twenties. Well, I mean, I had student loans. I didn't pay them off until you know well after I got married in my early forties. So right. you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes a lifelong problem and it really does, as you say, it limits, it limits the actual, you know, what was Milton Friedman's famous PBS series and the book he wrote out of it called Freedom to Choose. That's the great freedom. Um, it's incredible to me how something like education, which was thought to be for so many years the passport to freedom, has now become the instrument of servitude. Uh, right. and that's, and that's a real reversal. Right. Yeah, it is. Um, and I, and I agree with you. I, I'd actually, the economists I talked to, I'd been surprised people talked a lot about debt relief, but almost solely in the context of mortgages uh -huh. and very few people with respect to student debt. Although, as you say, I mean, you know, and I, the early in, in, the early years of our country, you know, when we had indentured servants, I think the standard indentured servitude was seven years. Right. Um, and student loans, I think, are 20, generally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so, it's, yeah, it's, it's very, 
Yeah, it is. And, and, uh, and particularly, obviously, when now they're coming out of school um, with the kind of joblessness that we have. Um, Just one other thing on that, um, which is, I'm, it's great that it's being taken up as an issue, but we should also be mindful of something else. I mean, you know, I teach at uh, CUNY, uh, City University of New York, up until 1975, that was, it was a free education. It was completely right. free. Yeah. It's public education. Um, and in the 70s, you know, that was the real struggle, you know, uh, free education versus pay. Then it became, you know, pay versus loans. And then it's loans versus mega loans. And now we're, you know, we're, we've really been pushed back so far and up against a wall that now we're resorting to, as Graeber put, you know, it says, like we're resorting to ancient models of kings, you know, wiping the slate clean. I mean, that's, you know, on the one hand, it's a great thing to, uh, to demand the elimination of debt. So don't get me wrong. But it does show you that we're really, you know, we're really marching backwards if the model we have of our emancipation has to be drawn from ancient Sumer. Um, right. That was that was not supposed to be the promise of the 20th century. Right, right. I mean, yeah, Mike Consul did that great um, where he broke down the 90s. Yes. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, referred to it essentially as a peasant's revolt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And, I mean, that's, yeah, that is where we are. I mean, that's how kind of, you know, that's the kind of inequality that we're dealing with at yeah. this point. And, and I don't. I don't know if, you know, the last time we had this kind of inequality, there was this kind of debt. I don't, I don't recall hearing that being the same kind of issue um, where people were, where debt restructuring was a big part of what people were talking about doing or, you know, something that had to happen. I mean, the debt thing might add a new yeah. uh, element, I guess, to that. Although, like I said, keep in mind, I mean, in Jim Crow South, right, which persists until the 19, you know, 50s, um, you know, debt really does, you know, that kind of sharecropping, you know, is is a, is a, a system of debt and servitude. Um, but you're right. I mean, it was certainly in the 30s, you know, not really the major cry um, around around which people were rallying. I mean, there it was have work pay more, you know, now it's, nobody even touches the question of work and pay. It's really just eliminate the goddamn debt. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. Um, And hopefully, you know, uh, I've talked to a lot of economists and economic thinkers, and actually the only person, you know, I asked them both what they thought the problems were and what their prescription would be. And the only person who mentioned free education along a CUNY, um, system lines was Doug Henwood. Nobody else even mentioned that idea. And, and, you know, my father was educated in the UC system in California, which also was essentially free at that time. Um, so yeah, and he had no debt, absolutely no debt, uh, coming out of, um, you know, he went, he got two different bachelor's degrees and went part way through a PhD program with no debt. So, you know, you know, years and years of school. Right. And, and that's really important. I mean, that was, you know, people forget these kind of concrete details. Like that is what the liberal welfare state, that was what the promise of it was, was that, you know, you could get a first class education at a place like the UC system or right. CUNY and you could, you know, come out of it. And and the other thing that's really interesting about that is, that was the 1950s. I mean, I don't know when your your dad got this, but you know, we're talking the 1950s and 1960s. Right. Um, you know, the notion of conservatism again. You know, that oftentimes they present themselves as you know we kind of want to go back to uh, you know Ozzie and Harriet and Leave It to Beaver, which was the 1950s. Well, the 1950s was kind of Sweden in this country. I mean, comparatively speaking to where we are today, they don't want to go back to that at all. You know, they really right. want to go back to the 1880s, the 1890s. I mean, I think it was Bill Greider, the journalist, who said that the, the, the program of the Republican Party is to repeal the 20th century. And uh, that is not, if, if, if your vision of society is grounded in something that existed maybe in the 1880s, 
or 1890s, 120, 130 years ago. To my mind, that makes you as much a visionary of a great leap forward as it is the great leap backwards, right? I mean, you're, you're reaching back for something that was so long ago, it's as utopian as anything the left has ever proposed, right? In the literal right. sense that it's, it doesn't exist on the face of this earth right now, here. I mean, at least in the United States. Right, right, right. And that's the, you know, to the extent that, I mean, the, to the extent that I thought that there was, you know, and you and you kind of chide people for saying that this is a reading of Burke that's based on, you know, a couple of passages from from reflections from the French Revolution. And and it is. Um, but it, it was it's really an epistemological claim that I, you know, about the fact that, you know, things are very complicated and interrelated. And so you can't just wipe the slate clean. And, and that to me seemed, but, but at what exactly you're saying is that they would love to do that. Yeah. They would love to wipe the slate clean. They would love to go back, you know, and undo all kinds of things, which is why people say, you know, that modern conservatism is radical, right? As opposed to conservative. And what you're saying is that, that idea of conservatism is really just a fairy tale, and it's always been yeah that kind of program, right? Right. And, and Burke himself, when he you know he has a, an exchange of letters with an emigre, uh, an aristocratic emigre from France who's fled, and they're all plotting ways to restore the monarchy. And Burke writes in a letter. He says, you know, let's. Uh, I, I'm not quoting exactly, but you know, let's be clear about something. Whatever we restore, it will be. And this is an exact quote in some measure a new thing right we're not we're not we're not going back right we're creating something new uh and i you know i take that to mean you know in some ways we're as much jacobins as they are uh because at a fundamental level what we're saying is uh we can order time you know we can determine the timetable of political creation and political destruction we're not just gardeners we're not just caretakers, you know, mm -hmm. passing on an inheritance. No, we are destroyers and creators in the same way that they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all very interesting. Um, well, it, you know, what would, in, if, if there's a rejection of the kind of what's the matter with Kansas thesis, you know, I think that that's driven a lot of the talk on the left in terms of, you know, what should the strategy be and how, you know, so how does that change that? I mean, how do you see the not, and not just Occupy Wall Street, but the left in general going forward? I think I heard you say something about um, the fact that, that, you know, really conservatism won, it triumphed. Yeah. But that that's not necessarily a good thing. They think that's, you know, that maybe it's reached a kind of pinnacle and not, is on its way down. So, right. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's two points here. One is, I mean, and this is something I say at the end of the book, and it's it's speculative, so I, I don't want to, um, you know, hang my hat right. on it or anything. But, <laughs> right. Um, you know, my suspicion for a while has been that George Bush was the kind of Lyndon Johnson of the Republican Party. That is to say, you know, Lyndon Johnson gets reelected in a massive landslide in 1964. It is really, you know, a thorough repudiation of the Republican Party. People talk about, you know, liberalism is, you know, will be hegemonic for decades to come. And, of course, what we now know is, is that, that 1964 to 1968, that was the beginning of the end. That was the unraveling of the right, New right. Deal and of modern liberalism. And that everything that follows that is really just a long decline. And the reason for that is, is that, it, you know, it, it, this isn't just peculiar to conservatism or liberalism. It's, I think, true of most kinds of politics is that when you're at the apex of power and doing everything, right, you set certain things in motion. You make commitments that will stir up antagonisms within your own coalition. So in the case of Johnson, right, it's, it's, it's the white South versus civil rights, you know, things like that will happen. And I think something like that happened with Bush. It was on the one hand, the anti-tax part of the Republican Party. And on the other hand, it's the imperial part of the Republican Party. And Bush, for the very first time in American history, fought a war without raising taxes. In fact, had cut taxes. It had never been done before. It was entirely on borrowed, on debt, <laughs> to come back to your other issue. Right. Uh, and that sets in motion a whole set of problems 
that we will be living with for some time, but I think represent the long-term decline of the Republican Party, uh, even despite things like the 2010 uh, victory of the Tea Party and all the rest of it. Um, and, uh, you know, how long it will be and how much damage they will do on their way out is, is the real question. Uh, right. but, but I do think that's what's happening. Now, for the left, which I think was the other part of your question, um, that's, a, that's trickier, but I, I guess I would just say one thing, and I, I mentioned, I talked about this a bit in a piece I did for the London Review of Books over the summer. I think one thing that people on the left have yet to reckon with is the fact that since the 1970s, really, is, is how little the American, the average American citizen gets from the American state compared to other welfare states. Look at all the things that you do not get from the American state. You don't get guaranteed health care. You don't get guaranteed public transportation. You don't get guaranteed education, right? There are a lot of basics, housing, right, that we just don't get. And I think this has put liberals and the left in a very precarious position, which is, you know, how do you go out and make the case for higher taxes uh, when you're not really giving back to people, or even a good pension. I mean, you know, Social Security, I mean, is certainly not enough to give you a pension, you know, in retirement. All the basic right. things that a good welfare state should do, the United States, we don't provide in the United States. And so when the Republicans say, we're going to cut your taxes, you know, that is literally, in a very literal sense, change. You can believe it. It's change in your pocket. Um, yeah, and the and 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 Democrats just don't have something like that to offer to people. Um, so I would I would sort of start with that insight. Where it gets you to, I don't know. Uh, but to just say that you can't. Uh, I mean, well, all right, put it this way: in my lifetime, the only time I've heard Democrats talk about raising taxes is to cut the deficit. That is just not a winning program. You know, it's never let's raise taxes so you can get free health care. Let's raise taxes so you can get a decent public education. Let's raise taxes so you can have good public transportation if you're living in a city. It's let's raise taxes so we can bring down the deficit. Well, nobody, Cheney was right. Nobody cares about deficits. They don't matter. Um, politically, I should say. I mean, economically, they obviously do. Uh, so I think that really uh, is something that Democrats really need to think hard about. Uh, is if you want to, um, it's kind of a, you're 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 all in or you're not. You know, if you want to support a, a state intervention in the economy, you gotta you gotta give you gotta deliver. And right. you know, we just don't have a structure that delivers and hasn't delivered for a very long time. And the Republicans do deliver in the form of tax cuts. Right. Right. And that's, you know, I mean, I've talked to several progressive economists and economic thinkers and, you know, they spend a lot of time. I think I think they feel like they could construct plans like that. There's just no political will, yeah. um, you know, that we just lack the political will to fix our current economic crisis, to, you know, uh, make our health care affordable, to give public health care, to do any of those things. I think that. Um, that the economic thinkers I talk to feel like it; those things aren't hard. Those things aren't yeah. mysterious. Yeah. Um, we just flat lack the political will to do it. So, I think I think that's true, and I, I would say two things about that. One is uh, political will. You know, it's <laughs> it's like the problem of the philosophical will. It doesn't it doesn't come from somewhere. It's you got to will it. Like you, you got to just do it, and you have to be. And I think. Here we could learn something from the Republican Party and conservative movement from the 60s. You have to be willing to fail. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nothing was ever achieved in this country uh, that was good without people willing to risk failure time right. and time and again. You know, um, I, I've talked about this a lot. You know, it took 100 years to get a weekend in this country. Um, you know, I'm not saying this is a 100-year program, but, you know... Right. <laughs> That means a hundred years of failure before we got it. It just didn't happen. So that's the first thing. But the other thing I think what we do lack beyond political will is a coherent ideology to 
make sense of those programs. Um, you know, I, and here I think we come back to the issue of freedom. I think liberals in the left have ceded that language, which remember that is the lingua franca of American politics. Eric Foner, the historian at Columbia, wrote a great book called The Story of American Freedom, where you know he basically made the point: whoever controls the, that term controls the political universe in America. Mm -hmm. And it is time, I think, for liberals and leftists to start making the case that we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, do you want to be free? Well, this is what it requires. It requires a strong state. And we know that that seems counterintuitive. It runs against everything we've been taught and told for the last half century. But lo and behold, it actually turns out to be true. Right, right, and be willing to tell that story, I, and I think that's a good that's a good place to um, end. Is that I think you know, Chris Hedges makes the point that Occupy Wall Street finally did what the left hadn't done, which is to be willing to fail and to stand up and fight back, yeah. um, to go show up at a park and not know what was going to happen or where it was going to go, or you know, to call for a general strike in Oakland and to do all kinds of things to at least just start to fight back, you yeah. know, so that you're not just kind of playing it safe politically and playing it safe, you know, at some point, I think you're exactly right that, you know, we just have to start fighting these issues and start telling the story that makes sense as opposed to, you know, unfortunately, you know, Obama has been so, you know, just deeply committed to this centrist narrative um, that, there isn't. I, I think I would absolutely agree with you that there isn't a coherent story on the left um, about these things. Um, and that makes, and, and there was actually, that was kind of a big issue at one point, I'm sure you were aware earlier, the Drew Weston piece, where there was this kind of like, does that story matter? Does that ma narrative matter? So you obviously fall on the side that yes, it matters. It matters, maybe not in the way he meant it. Um, it doesn't matter that I think it's like, I don't think if Obama suddenly one day starts telling that story, he's gonna, you know, get the right. votes of Congress. But what it does matter, and I think um, somebody pointed this out in a response uh, to a criticism of that piece, what it matters is that it lays down a marker um, mm -hmm. that uh, you, you know, that you start a discussion in the, in the way that Occupy Wall Street has done, right? It has mm -hmm. laid down a marker and it has started a discussion that I don't think we're going to win on in this election cycle or the next one by any stretch. But you're not going to win on it in 10 years from now uh, because you didn't start talking about it now. I mean, that just is counterintuitive. You're going to win it in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, however long it is, precisely because you were willing to start making the case right now. Right. Well, very good. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. Thank and you. I will make sure to link your blog, your oh, book. You also mentioned um, that you had written a piece, was it for the London? The London Review of Books. London yeah, Review of Books. I'll link that as well. Okay. So, um, and if there's anything else, just email me and we'll be happy to link that. And when the piece is up, we'll let you know. That sounds great. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.